A register is defined as a book or system of public records. When considering this word in a vacuum, so to speak, I'm reminded of the old telephone books that were still being published when I was a kid. Once or twice each year, two rather large paperback books, one yellow, the other white, would appear on our doorstep wrapped in plastic. The yellow pages was a list, or register, in which all the businesses in the metropolitan area of Miami published the names, addresses, and telephone numbers of local businesses often with simple graphics included. The white pages, on the other hand, was a list, or register, of the names, addresses, and telephone numbers of every person living in Miami-Dade County who owned a telephone. There were exceptions, of course. For a fee, residents could opt to have their entries omitted for privacy reasons. Nonetheless, except for those opting out, hundreds of thousands of names, addresses, and telephone numbers were published and provided to, the, to every person that lived in, in Miami-Dade County free of charge. And in those days, no one was screaming that this was a violation of any right to privacy. Certainly no one claimed that it was some sort of punishment. Times have changed, of course, and while yellow and white pages are no longer being published, the information contained in them is still not only available, but has been widely expanded. As an example, by sitting at my desk in my home here in southern Germany, I was able to not only find my brother's new address in Jacksonville, Florida, but was even able to view his home from the street level with only a few clicks of the mouse on Google Maps. If I was a bit more motivated, which I'm not, I could probably find out how much he paid in property tax by an online visit to the official Duval County Tax Collector's website. Considering that the American right to privacy is not explicitly enumerated in the, in the United States Constitution or her amendments, the Americans have come to accept a rather weak interpretation of that right. Hence, Americans have a high tolerance for more of their personal information being published than Europeans. To use my brother as an example once again, he owns a handgun and holds a permit to carry it concealed. Thus, his name, address, and other bits of personal data are contained within the registry of firearms owners maintained by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. It should be noted that this registry is only available to law enforcement officials and not otherwise available to the public. Similarly, my brother holds a driver's license in Florida, and while the fact of his holding a driver's license is public information, the information contained on that license, his name, address, and so on, are strictly confidential and cannot be made available to the public. By contrast, the right to privacy is very clearly spelled out in both German law and human rights law here in Europe. Here in Germany, where I live, it is virtually impossible to find a person's home address. It is worth reiterating that the American concept of privacy is significantly different from that of the European concept. And while publishing certain bits of personal information might be perfectly legal in the United States, to do so in Germany would constitute a criminal offense. In this video, I wish to focus on a specific form of register that was first developed in the United States and is now beginning to sprout in a few other nations. I am, of course, referring to the American-style register of persons convicted of sex-related offenses. International human rights law recognizes that a government has an interest in preventing crime and protecting its most vulnerable citizens. This interest has never been seriously challenged in court. Of course, the government's interest has to be balanced against the individual rights of its citizens. While governments often temporarily restrict the rights of individual citizens when those citizens are being punished for crimes, once those citizens have successfully completed their punishments, in theory, their rights are restored. And that includes citizens convicted of sex-related offenses. So, if the government has an interest in preventing future crimes, how far can a government encroach on such a person's right to privacy by publishing personal details of their lives on the internet before the government can be said to have gone too far? The answer, of course, is going to depend on whether the right to privacy is being defined by the American law or international human rights law. Unlike the driver's license and firearms registries,
The registries of persons convicted of sex-related offenses in Florida strips away all aspects of the right to privacy. According to Florida law, sexual offenders have a reduced expectation of privacy based on the public's interest in public safety and in the effective operation of government. Releasing sexual offender information to law enforcement agencies and to persons who request such information, and the releasing of such information to the public by a law enforcement agency or any other public agency will further the governmental interests of public safety. So says the Florida statutes. In that registry, via government websites, the following information concerning registrants is widely disseminated to the public. Name, address, date of birth, photograph, height, weight, identifying marks and tattoos, address of employment, model and color of automobile, license plate number of automobile, nature and title of criminal convictions, and so on. The pervasive nature of the various state and federal sex offender registries in the United States at this point is well known. Generally speaking, a registry is a dry record of facts which does not command action of any sort, at least not of the sort I described above. However, when the focus is on the registry of those persons convicted of sexual related crimes, a wide range of restrictions on the freedoms of said persons, such as where the person can reside, where they can attend school, where they can spend their leisure hours, where and for how long they can travel and so on, are also attached. These restrictions continue indefinitely, often until the end of the person's life, and are unaffected by the successful termination of one's court-imposed sentence. The theory behind the registry of persons convicted of sex-related offenses is the tracking of such persons comports with the government's interest in preventing future crimes and protecting its most vulnerable citizens. While the United States is one of the few nations on our shared planet that is not legally bound to any form of human rights treaty, the public nature of the American registries and the attendant lifelong restrictions on personal freedoms have begged the question as to whether they otherwise violate the right to privacy as recognized under human rights law. The various state and national governments of the United States, not being bound to these treaties, have not concerned themselves with human rights law, but have focused instead on whether these restrictions or these registries comply with the provisions of the United States Constitution and her amendments, as well as with the individual state constitutions. Given that the rights enumerated in the United States Constitution are somewhat more limited in number and scope than those found in human rights treaties, American courts have found the registries to be constitutional. And given that the United States is not a signatory to any human rights treaty, none of the state or federal registries have been subjected to judicial review in a human rights court, at least not yet. Surely it was only a matter of time before the United States began to exert its influence on the world stage and export these registries to other countries, particularly those countries which are financially or politically dependent on the United States. As I live in Europe, I have paid particular attention to the slow expansion of sex offender registries into certain European Union member states. While it is true that some member states, notably Iceland and Finland, have flatly rejected the idea of installing registries to track those persons convicted of sex-related offenses, other countries, such as France, Poland, and Hungary, to varying degrees have opted to give these registries a try. While the United States may not be bound to any treaty requiring it to abide by human rights law, all member states of the Council of Europe are indeed bound by the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. Alleged violations of any article of the Convention are reviewed by the European Court on Human Rights located in Strasbourg, France. The Sex Offenders Registry of France was the first to be challenged in the Human Rights Court in 2005. It is to that judicial challenge that we will now turn our attention. In 2005, a French citizen was released from prison and informed that he was required to register his home address every six months with the police in accordance with France's sex offender registry. He was not required to provide any further personal information. Additionally, if he were to change his address, he was required to notify the police within 15 days. Failure to register could result in a prison term of up to two years. He was also informed that the registry containing his name and address would be made available only to specifically authorized government officials and would not be made available to the general public. Monsieur Gadel made a legal challenge to the European Court of Human Rights. He challenged his placement on the registry on the grounds that so doing violated Articles 7 by unlawfully adding an additional burden to a sentence, and 8 
for compelling him to provide private details to the police. In reviewing Gardell's challenges, the court considered the following. Article 7 of the Convention states, No one shall be held guilty of any criminal offense on account of any act or omission which did not constitute a criminal offense under national or international law at the time when it was committed. Nor shall a heavier penalty be imposed than the one that was applicable at the time the criminal offense was committed. Even the most casual viewer will hear the concordant tones of the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution, commonly referred to as the Double Jeopardy Clause. In short, if a person has already been convicted and sentenced by a court, thereafter that person's punishment cannot be increased or made more burdensome. Article 8, Section 1 of the Convention states, Everyone has the right to respect for his private life. Interestingly, there is no such explicit guarantee written into the United States Constitution or her amendments. Similar to both the United States and Europe, Article 8, Section 1 provides that governments may, under special and short-term circumstances, limit the rights guaranteed to their citizens. There shall be no interference by a public authority with the exercise of this right, except such as in accordance with the law and is necessary in a democratic society in the interests of national security, public safety, for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. In order for any claim of double jeopardy under Article 7 of the Convention to succeed, Gardell had to convince the court that being compelled to provide his name and address to the police was a form of punishment which made his original sentence more burdensome. While it was not explicitly noted in Gardell's legal challenge, the French sex offender registry makes no further demands on him, nor places any restrictions on where he can make his residence. To say it another way, Gardell was free to live quietly anywhere in the world he wanted without any legal restrictions of any kind so long as he reported his address to the police if his residence was inside a French territory. If merely having to register one's name and address with the government constitutes a punishment, what would that mean for the millions of law-abiding citizens compelled to register their names and addresses when they obtain driver's licenses, or purchase cars, or purchase firearms, or register to vote, or file tax returns? No one has claimed that those registries constitute some sort of punishment. In response to Gardell's claim, the French government argued that merely registering one's name and address every six months is not so burdensome as to constitute some sort of punishment. In fact, there are no further requirements from any registrant. It further noted that he did not even have to inconvenience himself by personally visiting a police station to satisfy the registration requirements. Under the law, he is welcome to register via registered mail from the comfort of his own home. As you would expect, France reminded the court of the provisions within the convention which permits governments to infringe on the rights of persons for short periods when it is necessary, among other things, to prevent crime. The court ultimately was required to weigh Gardell's protection against double jeopardy and the government's interest in public safety and the prevention of crime. The question then, was Gardell's requirement to register his name and address so burdensome to him that it outweighed the government's interest in public safety and the prevention of crime? The court found that the requirements of the registry did not amount to an undue burden on Gardell. Not really surprising. For any claim under Article 8 of the Convention to succeed, Gardell was required to prove that his privacy had been violated and that the violation was unwarranted. As mentioned above, the information contained in the French Sex Offender Registry is available only to specifically authorized government officials. It is not available to the public. Nonetheless, Gardell argued that the registration of this information limited his freedom of movement, though he failed to articulate exactly how his movement was limited. In considering Gardell's claim, the court recognized European case law, which holds that the storing by a public authority of information relating to an individual's private life amounts to interference within the meaning of Article 8. It went on to explain that the protection of personal data is of fundamental importance to a person's enjoyment of his or her right to respect for private life, as well as family life, as guaranteed by Article 8 of the Convention. 
France claimed that registrants were less likely to commit new crimes because they would know that the police were keeping an eye on them, and if they were to commit new offenses, the police would be able to locate them more quickly. While the registry might infringe slightly on Gardel's right to privacy by asking for his home address, that infringement was minimal considering that the registry is confidential and available only to specifically authorized law enforcement officials and is never made available to the public. In weighing Gardell's right to privacy against the government's interest in public safety and the prevention of crime, the court found that Gardell's privacy was not unduly infringed upon. In the end, the court struck down Gardell's challenges and upheld the French sex offender registry. In doing so, the court found that the sex offenders registry struck a fair balance between the competing private and public interests at stake and that France did not over overstep the acceptable margin of the appreciation in that regard. Compare this with the registry of the state of Florida, where I'm from, in which registrants are required to register their telephone numbers, email addresses, internet identifiers, descriptions of the automobiles and boats, license plate numbers for their automobiles and boats, their employer's name, their employer's address, and so on and so on, and as well as um, providing updated mugshots, all of which are then made available to their friends, neighbors, co-workers, fellow church members, and classmates via government websites for the remainder of their lives. So thank you for watching. I hope you gained some information out of this. I hope you found it enlightening. Uh, we will continue to review the sex offender registries here in Europe because France is not the only one. The next one we'll talk about is Poland, which in my opinion is starting to push the boundaries of what is legally acceptable, and also Hungary, which has a Florida slash American style sex offender registry, which in my opinion clearly violates international human rights. We will be challenging those laws in the future, but for the moment we're going to make some videos about it. So until next time, be safe and be smart. And if you're not happy with your situation, if you're not satisfied with it, do something about it. Until next time. Cheers. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you like what we do and you want to support what we do and maybe help pay off some of these legal bills, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You'll find the link in the description below.